topic tonight is multiple sclerosis. And at Great Plains, we're very interested in this illness and whether there can be a lot of environmental and nutritional factors that are involved in multiple sclerosis. So as a consequence, we join forces with Dr. Bill Code, at a, who's in private practice in uh, Canada and British Columbia, who is a physician who specializes in the uh, holistic treatment of multiple sclerosis and has written a couple of books on the nutritional uh, treatment of multiple sclerosis. And uh, he talks from uh, uh, experience because he is a person who has multiple sclerosis, which is now in remission in large part due to the adoption of these uh, nutritional uh, therapies. So it's a great pleasure to be presenting uh, some of this research uh, here tonight. And I want to emphasize that the, the uh, webinar will last about an hour, at which point there will be time for questions and answers uh, at, at the end until uh, a good chunk of the uh, questions are uh, answered. And then for those who still have additional questions, of course, you can uh, contact uh, the laboratory by email if you have uh, further testing. So I'm going to be covering a good bit of information. I'm going to be covering the literature, the medical literature that's already out there, as well as uh, the results from our, the laboratory testing done here at Great Plains. So we had, uh, in the pilot study, we had nine females and three males. Like many autoimmune diseases, uh, there are many more females than, than males. Uh, the age range was 31 to 63 years at the time of the testing. Dr. Code in Canada uh, made the uh, diagnosis, and the uh, patients are being treated on the, for their, uh, based on their abnormal biochemical test. And the pilot study is uh, still ongoing, but the testing phase is now complete. The patients are still being uh, treated based on these uh, test results. So these are the uh, tests performed, and there's a couple of new ones that I'll be talking about near the end of the webinar. So we're doing the urine organic acid test. Uh, the hair metal test for both essential and toxic chemicals in hair, because we find that both deficiencies or excesses of metals can lead to chronic illness. And even though we're, we're focusing on multiple sclerosis, what we found is that many chronic diseases, uh, these same tests can give invaluable uh, information. Uh, the, I'm going to present some of the data on the IgG food allergy test, the IgG antibody test for antibodies to candida, a common uh, yeast that infects uh, humans. We'll be talking about comprehensive fatty acid tests and especially the omega-3 fatty acids which have been, set, been found to be so effective in treating chronic illness. We'll be talking about the opiate peptides in urine, the comprehensive stool test for the uh, abnormal microorganisms, for plasma amino acids, for the evaluation of two elements that work together, uh, which are copper and uh, zinc. And so they have to have a certain balance and part of that balance is, is having the right amount of ceruloplasmin, which is a protein that, that uh, binds and transports copper. I'm going to be talking about a test that is highly specific for, for uh, celiac disease called transglutaminase antibodies, and, and uh, a new test that was just developed 
at Great Plains, and for which it is now the only laboratory in the world offering this, is called the phospholipase A2 assay uh, in urine. And, and we have some very exciting uh, data on that, which will be near the end of the presentation. So uh, I looked at several very comprehensive studies. And uh, this was a very interesting one from, from, uh, from Brazil uh, and uh, individuals in looking at multiple uh, factors in Rio de Janeiro. And, and one of the most uh, remarkable uh, things when looking at uh, risk factors for multiple sclerosis was that individuals who got the government recommended vaccines had a 16-fold risk of developing multiple sclerosis. And, and what was fascinating is that individuals who got measles just by getting infected by somebody else had a marked decrease in the incidence of MS, uh, showing that getting the natural disease conferred much better resistance to multiple sclerosis compared to standard uh, vaccination. I know this is an extremely hot topic in the news these days about trying to force people to get uh, their children get measles vaccines, but this is one instance where uh, it was uh, shown that, uh, as I mentioned, that getting the standard vaccines puts you at much greater risk of developing uh, multiple sclerosis. So this debate isn't over. Of course, the government would like it to be over to simplify things and to uh, make people do what they want to do. But unfortunately, the scientific evidence uh, indicates otherwise. I saw another study was almost identical results from Italy again, finding uh, that individuals with, uh, who got the uh, natural measles were much more protected against uh, multiple sclerosis. Cigarette smoking was bad for you. So in addition to lung cancer and pulmonary disease, the study showed that smoking cigarettes makes you much more likely to develop MS. Uh, it also found interesting enough that being single is, uh, is uh, bad for your health. Uh, if you eat animal brain, that, that's not good for you either. That increases the risk, a threefold risk of developing uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, and uh, having foreign ancestors also increase the risk. Presumably this is because of uh, perhaps some genetic incompatibility. Uh, in individuals from from other countries may have uh, a mixed set of genes that maybe are not as uh, protective as individuals whose genes have been somewhat uh, homogenized in the local country. Interestingly enough, this is another case that you may have heard about alcohol being small amounts of alcohol being good for you and and raising your uh, HDL cholesterol and reducing uh, heart disease and taking uh, alcohol in moderation also cut the risk of getting MS by uh, considerably by about 80 percent compared to the uh, average individual. And as I mentioned, uh, getting the measles by the old-fashioned way, which is by becoming infected from another person was also highly protective. And one of the ways in which uh, it's thought that vaccines can be harmful is because of uh, inducing autoimmunity. Uh, it's found that there's antibodies to brain proteins in multiple sclerosis, and it's thought that uh, some of these uh, antibodies are due to uh, exposure to, to proteins in the vaccines that have a similarity to uh, human brain. And, and that by getting these uh, vaccines that there, it induces uh, autoimmunity. Uh, so 
so here's some of the uh, evidence of associated with the hepatitis B vaccine, a vaccine that is now given to babies on the uh, first day of life. So it showed that uh, MS-like syndromes followed uh, hepatitis B vaccination using, uh, pl if they use plasma-derived uh, hepatitis B antigen. Uh, there have been reports of demyelination, which is one of the main uh, symptoms of MS following hepatitis B vaccination. Uh, there are neurological symptoms and signs as well as magnetic resonance imaging or MRI showing demyelinization days to weeks after hepatitis B vaccine. And in the uh, UK, it showed that hepatitis B vaccine immunization was associated with a threefold increase in the incidence of MS for three years following vaccination. So, so there is uh, a lot of considerable evidence that, that, uh, that uh, vaccines may increase the, the uh, incidence of MS. Uh, fungal infection is one in which there's increasing evidence that this may be a significant factor in, in uh, multiple sclerosis. And this could also happen uh, due to the induction of autoimmunity. Studies have shown that, that individuals who have had uh, candida produce antibodies that cross-react against, against human brain proteins. So the candida could be another factor that leads to the induction of antibodies that result in uh, multiple sclerosis. So in this particular study, they did a number of studies. They tested for an antigen common in uh, common in the blood of, indivi of uh, individuals with candida called beta-1,3 glucan, which is a polysaccharide made specifically by fungus. They also tested the DNA uh, of the uh, yeast cells by a technique called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, and they also measured the uh, antibodies to uh, candida yeast as well. So in this group, which, in, which is a small group, it was found that, uh, that all seven patients with multiple sclerosis had elevated uh, candida test, so seven out of seven. So in this particular study, here is the group of uh, people, and you see MS1 through MS7, meaning a patient uh, with multiple sclerosis. It gives their birth year, their gender, and some idea of their degree of impairment. So for example, MS1 patient was wheelchair-bound, uh, MS2 had some difficulties in walking and talking. MS3, uh, 4, and 6 also were wheelchair-bound, whereas uh, patients MS5 and 7 had slight problems in walking. So uh, what was fascinating is that they looked at the antibodies against different candida species. And you see at the top uh, C, F, C, A. So the C stands for candida. The F stands for the species of candida. So for example, F stands for fomata. So C, F would be candida fomata. C, A would be candida albicans. CP, candida parapsilosis, and so you see MS patient uh, number one had antibodies against three of the five species of candida. MS patient two had antibodies against all species of candida, and it was only MS patient six that was negative uh, for all candida antibodies.
So in addition to looking at the human antibodies produced against candida, they also looked at the te technique called polymerase chain reaction in which they, they, um, uh, they measure the, uh, the DNA for the rib ribosomal RNA gene and measure the number of copies in a milliliter, which is a, a very small amount about 20 drops of blood. So uh, as you can see, the uh, MS1 patient had 5,423 copies of uh, uh, fungus uh, DNA. Uh, only MS patient 2 uh, was negative. So six of the seven patients had significant amounts of DNA coding for for uh, the uh, RNA of uh, fungus. Uh, there's also a test called Fungitel, with the idea it's kind of the, the trade name was telling if you have fungus. That's the name, that's where the name is derived from. And they measure a specific uh, polysaccharide that's only produced by fungus. And again, they found that uh, a high portion of the patients had um, positive results by this test. So summarizing, six of the seven patients were positive for fungus using the DNA uh, measurement. Four of seven patients were positive for measuring the polysaccharide, and seven of the seven patients were positive for either the PCR the beta glucan or both assays. So a very impressive uh, group of positive results. But I think impressive enough that it looks to me that antifungal treatment uh, should be considered in any patient who has multiple sclerosis. And the Great Plains test using the uh, markers found in the urine organic acid test, we found 100%, 12 of 12 patient samples had elevated yeast fungal markers. We also found that 75%, 9 out of 12 of the patients had increased IgG antibodies to candida, found that 83% had increased IgG antibodies to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the uh, type of yeast found in baker's yeast and also in uh, brewer's yeast, the, the, the yeast that's used to make uh, beer and wine. Uh, in addition, 17% of patients had, had uh, high results for harmful Clostridia species, uh, either for Cresol or HPHPA. Uh, and so on the organic acid test, we, we can also pick up other abnormal chemicals, and, and I want to talk a little bit about the oxalates. So a high percentage, 5 of 12 or 42 percent, had elevated oxalates, uh, which are a kind of stone. Just when you think of a stone, it's just like a stone that you would see in your gravel in your driveway, but it can form in different tissues in the body. And it's associated with kidney damage uh, and, can, and, and can cause kidney stones, but it can deposit in tissues throughout the body causing atherosclerosis, stroke, autism, and many other diseases. The oxalates can also deposit in the brain and in the blood-brain barrier, in, impairing the function of the brain. Uh, it's also been found that high oxalates are associated with candida. Uh, it was found in, the, in our study using the organic acid markers that 42% had elevated uh, methylglutaric acid, which is a marker associated with damage to the mitochondria. So in these individuals, they could take nutritional supplements that support the mitochondria. Five of 12 also had deficient phosphate. The most common reason for, low, for uh, deficient phosphate is vitamin D deficiency, which is another factor that is 
has been associated. Many, many studies have associated multiple sclerosis with vitamin D deficiency. Uh, and three of the 12, or 25 percent, had elevated uh, amounts of a, the ratio between certain neurotransmitters indicating a relative excess of dopamine, which in high amounts can cause uh, oxidative stress and uh, damage to the brain. It was also found that uh, uh, three methyl glutaric and methyl glutaconic acid, uh, which were elevated uh, by a significant and a significant number of people, may be associated with defects in the mitochondrial uh, DNA. And by the way, Great Plains Laboratory in about a month will have a, uh, a new test that is specific for uh, mitochondrial uh, damage for those individuals who suspect it is, a, it is a more specific test for mitochondrial damage. Now I want to just show you some of these oxalates that were found in a high percentage of the individuals with multiple sclerosis. So one of these was the, um, the oxalate stones, and I'm just going to back up in that just to show you the outline of the stone. So they call these staghorn type crystals uh, because stag meaning a deer. It looks like the horns of a deer. Uh, and, and so this, this kidney had to be removed because the, the stones were so large they were impairing the uh, kidney function. Uh, oxalate crystals can also form in the heart. So th the size of these ranges from uh, microscopic up to stones uh, the size of a golf ball and in some cases uh, even the size of a grapefruit. So these things can be, some cases can be huge. So these black uh, crystals here inside the heart, this is the, this red stuff is the, the heart uh, muscles themselves and click too early and the 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 black the black stuff is the oxalates the oxalates can be uh, a number of different colors the thing that's so significant is that you can see they can form very sharp edges like you see here and so as the heart muscle contracts uh, the heart muscle runs into these uh, sharp pieces. You could think of them like, like if your heart muscle were full of broken glass and the heart muscle is contracting against that and as it contracts the, the heart muscle is really just being torn apart uh, by these uh, crystals that can, uh, that can uh, tear it apart just like, just like a knife. Uh, oxalate crystals can also form in the bone, causing anemia and, uh, and deficiency of the immune system. They can actually uh, push out the bone marrow. Uh, they can also form in the bone structure itself, causing the bones to weaken. And it could be this is one of the reasons why a lot of elderly people began to have uh, problems with their bones is because they're weakened by these oxalate deposits in the bone. And oxalate crystals can form in the brain. This is a oxalate crystal in the brain. When I made the copy of this, uh, unfortunately you can't see the outline of the brain very well because the image was a little bit uh, light. Uh, oxalates can also form in the skin causing uh, necrosis. So this is the knee of an individual has the oxalate deposits uh, in the skin, which which causes uh, bruising and uh, and breaking down of the uh, tissues. Some of the other or markers in the organic acid that were elevated: glutaric acid, which can indicate problems with mitochondria or riboflavin deficiency. And three of 12 also had elevated amounts of 2-hydroxyhypuric acid, which can be formed either from 
aspartame, which is NutraSweet, the artificial sweetener in Diet Coke, or salicylates, the compound uh, in aspirin. So a number of studies have indicated that common foods can be a problem, and, and again, it may be the induction of autoimmunity, uh, in this case caused by food allergens that results in, uh, in problems. And what they did in this particular study, they looked at both animals and humans uh, to, to look at the kind of uh, uh, immune reactions they had to different uh, foods. And, and what was very surprising is that that in MS, the, the uh, amount of antibodies to a milk protein, bovine lactoglobulin, were extremely high. But one of the highest uh, food allergies was to bovine serum albumin, uh, the major protein in the blood of cows. So even though this is in the blood, there is a certain amount of the bovine serum albumin uh, in, in the uh, milk as well. Uh, now, if you compare this to individuals with diabetes, and, and this is uh, juvenile diabetes, you also see high amounts of this antibody. Um, and um, uh, in the individuals with uh, diabetes. Uh, and you see healthy controls down here, very low amounts of um, antibodies. Uh, one of the ones to look at is OVA, which is the, the, uh, the protein, egg protein, and you can see it's a pretty much a non-factor in any of uh, uh, these uh, diseases. So milk is a big culprit and a number of diseases in which autoimmunity is suspected. Uh, another thing is just looking at uh, milk and dairy consumption compared to multiple sclerosis uh, prevalence. So this was a worldwide study. They looked at the total consumption of milk and dairy products in 27 countries and 29 populations all over the world. And what they found it was a very high correlation between cow's milk uh, ingestion and the presence of multiple sclerosis. So uh, rho was 0.836. So a perfect relationship would be 1.0. But a finding of 0 0.83 is highly significant. You see over here, they're indicating that it's extremely unlikely uh, that this could be due to just uh, chance. So it appears that milk consumption, this is another thing where, of course, uh, the, some nutritional experts will, or dietitians will talk about how wonderful milk is as a food, but when we look at disease prevalence, which the, one of the things that stands out is you know, milk is probably uh, associated with more illness than, than perhaps any other food. It's probably actually a tie between milk and wheat. Um, heavy metals can, can play a, a significant role in, uh, in multiple sclerosis, and, and this is a case study of a particular patient in which there was significant improvement and multiple sclerosis after removal of heavy metals. Uh, this is a study out of Milan, Italy. And, and uh, in this study, they, they did what is called a challenge test. They gave him a chelating agent called EDTA and then measured the amount of toxic uh, chemicals excreted after the challenge and the patient had elevated values of aluminum, lead, and mercury. So these are some of the more toxic elements that we find in many, many different diseases. Uh, what was also interesting is that the patient had a big relapse 
and a, a worsening of the multiple sclerosis uh, symptoms uh, after a magnetic resonance uh, uh, test, imaging test, in which they used a, a metal called gadolinium, uh, and they used that to increase the contrast. So for those of you who are getting testing, I would strongly and get MRIs, I would strongly suggest that you ask your uh, physician not to include this metal because it is probably a somewhat of a toxic element similar to uh, mercury and, and lead. And so if you, unless they have extremely good reason, you should you should discuss this at length and don't just give in. Ask if this is absolutely necessary to get the information they want and can they get uh, comparable in information without using the GAD delinium. So after the chelation treatment, uh, they had significantly uh, improved symptoms and, and, uh, and, and as the the amount of heavy metals went back to the normal level. The, the uh, symptoms of MS went back to the normal level. So the relationship between multiple sclerosis and toxic elements is, I think, very well established. In this study, there were 47 uh, patients with MS who had mercury amalgams and Frequently, your dentist may cause your fillings, which are amalgams. You may call them silver fillings, but all these ones called silver fillings are roughly a 50-50 mix of uh, silver and mercury. And what they found is those that um, those with more amalgams had uh, greater symptoms of multiple sclerosis in Taiwan near, near uh, China. Uh, it was found that high amounts of lead and arsenic in the dirt was associated with a much higher incidence of multiple sclerosis. Uh, another study uh, showed that individuals with a variety of autoimmune diseases, including lupus, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, thyroid, um, thyroid autoimmune disease or eczema uh, had uh, problems and these patients often report clinical metal hypersensitivity especially to uh, nickel and what they did to what they did in this study is they tested the the allergy uh, to these different metals and, and found out that the, the patients uh, who had um, significant amounts of antibodies to metals um, were, had a worsening of symptoms and after they removed the amalgams the, that the uh, patients got better. So in this study they found the highest rate of improvement um, was in the patients with multiple sclerosis. So of all these autoimmune diseases, it was the patients who had amalgams, who had, uh, who were, had the amalgams removed, it was noticed that the, the greatest improvement rate was in patients with multiple sclerosis. And they also found those who were most allergic uh, based on their antibody test to mercury uh, were the ones that improved the most when the uh, dental amalgams were removed. Viruses uh, have been found to play a role in multiple sclerosis and in humans I think there's very good evidence that uh, herpes viruses uh, may be the ones, there have been multiple, this is another one in which there have been multiple studies and again the studies are, are substantial and there's a large number of them and so I think if, if you have multiple sclerosis it may be something you want to
consider, which is the use of uh, antiviral drugs. These are standard antiviral drugs that can uh, treat these uh, uh, human herpes viruses and 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 uh, um, the the treatment of them. Uh, you you might want to uh, find out if if you have these viruses, but some of these viruses are in a hidden form in the brain and might not even show up in a blood sample anyway. So for some individuals who have tried many treatments without success, you might want to consider just ask your physician about using, say, two months of antiviral treatment. So uh, according to this article, the Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, HHV6A, and varicella zoster virus are consistently linked with MS um, and with uh, exacerbations of existing uh, MS. The place where you live has a profound effect on the, on the odds that you'll develop MS. People who live in the uh, southern latitudes, like you see here, uh, uh, between 25 and uh, 30 degrees um, latitude, uh, degrees north, this means north of the equator, uh, those individuals who live south, like in uh, Florida, southern Florida, have the lowest incidence of MS and as the further north you go to the point of when you go to northern Canada, the incidence is much, much higher. Uh, and the reason almost surely is, uh, is related to the amount of vitamin D. Uh, you just have a difficult time getting enough vitamin D in the far uh, northern latitudes because even on the midsummer, uh, the, the um, the uh, uh, in midsummer you may get enough vitamin D, but the summers are so short, so there's only a very small time amount of time in the year that you can get adequate uh, vitamin D. Uh, omega-3 fatty acid consumption is uh, a very important factor, and we'll be getting to that. That's what we found in the Great Plains study. There was uh, that most of the individuals with MS uh, had uh, omega-3 uh, fatty acid deficiency. So in this study, they found that fish, fish consumption and omega-3 supplementation were very helpful in reducing uh, the incidence of multiple sclerosis. And this is true even though some fish have mercury. So the way I interpret this is that <clears throat> that the mercury in fish, especially larger fish, is is very toxic and is detrimental. But in some cases, especially if you're eating smaller fish, the the benefits of omega three may in some cases outweigh the harm of the of the mercury in fish. And so what I would strongly recommend is Eat only eat fish a lot, but only eat the smaller fish. Do not eat any large fish like tuna, like swordfish, like whale, for example, or uh, or any other extremely large fish. Because the larger the fish is, uh, the higher the amount of mercury in its tissue. So in this study, there was a clear dose-response relationship, and, and also individuals who ate more fish were, uh, were likely to have uh, a less severe uh, level of disease, if, even if they had MS. So in the Great Plains study, we analyzed fatty acids in all, in all the 12 patients, and only one of the 12 patients had a an optimum omega-6 uh, to omega-3 ratio, which is less than 
4.0. So 11 out of 12 or 85 percent had uh, had uh, bad uh, levels or insufficient levels of omega-3 fatty acids, the fatty acids that are found in high amounts in uh, seafood. So this particular scale uh, and which is from uh, this particular journal that's quoted right here if you want to um, if you want to look it up. And by the way, I want to emphasize that you know the the webinars are archived. So if you want to listen to it again, you can. If you want to tell your friends about it because you liked it and would and would like them to find out about it, you can just tell they're all archived. All you have to do is go to the home page of Great Plains and and uh, then uh, and and just look at archived uh, webinars and just put in um, there's a search so you can put in multiple sclerosis and the list of them will will uh, come up and you can listen to uh, one you like uh, again and again there's no there's no limit so anyway on this particular scale the the higher the value the more deficient the group is in omega-3 fatty acids. So it's estimated that probably the worst diet in the world is the urban India diet, which has um, about 50 times more omega-6, which is from vegetable oil compared to the omega-3 from uh, fish oil. The typical Western diet is also very bad uh, with a ratio between uh, 15 to uh, 20, and a high percentage of the patients with MS were uh, in this in this particular uh, range, and at a ratio of around 12, it's found that uh, there's increased incidence of mental illness, arthritis, heart disease, asthma. So you can see omega-3. Uh, supplementation is good for for diminishing almost every kind of chronic disease that's in the um, uh, Western diet. And uh, on the other hand, what you see in rural India, there's a, a different kind of diet, and their diet is much healthier. And of course, the people are living longer and doing better. And it's found that if you get a ratio of around five. Uh, that there's reduced uh, asthma symptoms, uh, that if you get down to a ratio of four, which only one of the patients with MS uh, had, that there is a, um, a significant 70% a decrease in cardiovascular disease. And, and in cancer, it's been found that if you get the ratio low enough, it actually suppresses the growth of cancer. So this is a, a really great health thing is to bring your uh, omega-3 down to uh, this uh, particular ratio. It's estimated that um, in the country of Greece before 1960, before all the junk foods were introduced, the ratio was one of the healthiest uh, on earth. And as you may know that some of the Greek islands have some of the most long-living uh, people, and it's also felt that our the diet of our caveman ancestors was down uh, at one or perhaps even less than one. So just remember in the group with multiple sclerosis that the vast majority had unfavorable amounts of omega-3. So one of the suggested treatments for MS is greatly increasing the amount of omega-3 uh, fatty acids. Now I want to get into some of the uh, essential elements which are tested by the hair metal test. So one sample, there wasn't enough hair to test. Uh, and what we found was really, really fascinating, which is that 64% had extremely low uh, lithium. So lithium is an essential element. So 
high amounts of lithium are used to treat individuals who have uh, bipolar depression using like gigantic amounts of lithium. But many people get trace amounts of lithium in their diet, but depending on the kind of diet or the kind of water the person drinks, they may be deficient. So deficient lithium is another one of the common factors with a wide range of, of uh, psychiatric and neurologic disorders. So a very high percentage of the individuals with MS had uh, nearly had ex uh, severe lithium deficiency. And what was also very surprising and to my knowledge had not been re repeated or, or reported before was 55% had molybdenum uh, deficiency as well. Uh, and 45% had deficiencies of other elements. So this was a variety. But by far, these two deficiencies of lithium and molybdenum uh, stood out. And so I think uh, this is going to be a highly important factor going forward in MS treatment. And molybdenum is important because it forms a part of a vitamin-like substance which is called a, a molybdenum cofactor. And this is the biochemical structure of it. It has this ring that is similar to that of folic acid. And perhaps it's derived from folic acid. The molybdenum right here binds to it in a form called molybdate. Uh, and it's also attached to a phosphate group. And the, the molybdenum is um, important because it, this particular molybdenum cofactor is involved in breaking down uh, certain of the compounds that are from nucleic acids, meaning DNA and RNA. So these substances are, are are um, uh, broken down in the body and they form uh, and they are necessary to form uh, uric acid. And uric acid is the substance that is elevated, oop, jumped the gun a little, uh, is the substance found in individuals with, uh, with uh, gout. And uh, Hold on one, oh, okay. <laughs> we're, we're getting a little bit of noise from the, the, the house cleaning crew. Uh, so, so the molybdenum is necessary to form uric acid, but, but individuals with uh, MS don't have enough molybdenum, and so they have lower amounts of uric acid and interesting enough, that's exactly what is found, that individuals with multiple sclerosis um, have low uric acid, and the low uric acid makes them more subject to getting MS. So people who have low uric acid, it's in something that's tested in almost every laboratory in the world. If the value is too low, it makes them much more subject to developing MS and I think the reverse is true. By increasing uric acid, increasing molybdenum, it will increase uric acid, which will uh, reverse the effects of, um, uh, of MS and lead to reduced symptoms of multiple sclerosis. So this is a, another slide showing uh, the same thing with the uh, molybdenum necessary to um, convert uh, xanthine and hypoxanthine to uric acid or urate. And I'm going to skip this because it's a little complicated. And so, so even though um, molybdenum is necessary to help to uh, make uh, uric acid, too much uric acid is bad. So if you're individuals who work in industries uh, in which they're exposed to high amounts of molybdenum, the workers may have too much uric acid 
which causes crystals of uric acid to form and cause gout. So what I'm discovering is that there are many things in this world that it's it's like Goldilocks that too hot is too is bad and too cold is bad and for many of the things that that are most favorable for health you need the value to be just right so individuals who work in companies where they get excess uh, molybdenum have gout like symptoms those who don't have enough may have multiple sclerosis so uh, uric acid is important because it is a substance cause an antioxidant. Antioxidants can be thought of as the molecules that put out the metabolic fire. So, so our, our metabolism uh, burns up a number of food, st food things like fat and glucose and but in doing so, the fire can get out of control, and the way it's controlled is with the antioxidants. So people, a lot of people know about vitamin C being an antioxidant. What they don't know is that uric acid is a much more important antioxidant than vitamin C in humans. So the concentration of vitamin C typically in, uh, in human serum is 50, compared to up to 400 for uric acid, so eight times as much antioxidant from the uric acid compared to the uh, vitamin C. So a number of studies have shown that there is a correlation between uric acid and disease states, uh, and those include multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and a inflammation of the uh, of the eye, optic neuritis. So all of these diseases are associated with deficiency of uric acid and deficiency of molybdenum. Uh, so many studies have found a connection between low uric acid and Parkinson's uh, disease. And just increasing the uric acid a small amount by 1.3 milligrams resulted in a 20% decrease in Parkinson uh, disease. And, and this is very impressive. A study of 47,000 men concluded that higher intakes of foods that increase uric acid result in a decreased risk of Parkinson's disease. And more, perhaps more importantly to the audience tonight is that uric acid plays a major role in multiple sclerosis. That, um, and what they found is that individuals um, who had uh, active multiple sclerosis had higher uric acid values, uh, 6.4 or higher, uh, compared to uh, those whose uh, multiple sclerosis was in remission, which is 4.76, and uh, so there was a, uh, and actually I think I said it, I think I said it wrong, those with the, those who had the highest uric acid, 6.41, had remitting MS, meaning their, their MS was in remission, whereas those who were having relapses had lower uric acid. And, and so uh, the people whose MS was in remission were much more similar to the controls, 6.41 and 6.33. So uric acid has a number of biochemical uh, actions. It, it removes a, a significant uh, oxidizing agent called peroxynitrite. And what was fascinating, they did a large epidemiologic study of people who had gout, and more, of more than a million people with gout, there was not a single instance of multiple sclerosis. So people who have high uric acid that results in gout, which is 
most commonly the pain in the big toe. The, the good thing about having that illness is it makes getting MS extremely uh, unlikely. So one of the things that can be thought of by this is by increasing molybdenum uh, that you should be able to reduce the, uh, the risk of developing MS and, and also reduce symptoms of MS if you have uh, severe MS at the present time. Uh, a Dr. Bruce Ames, who's at the University of California, one of the most famous biochemists who are still uh, active today, and the uh, the father of the uh, of the anti of the antioxidants, and also in the uh, field of determining uh, chemicals that cause mutations. Uh, so one of the most famous uh, still living uh, biochemist uh, hypothesizes that uric acid is the most important antioxidant in humans and it's the uh, major uh, antioxidant and it's also the, the major molecule that protects us against aging and cancer as well. So his theory is that humans we're able to attain the ages that we do, which is, you know, many of our um, many of our animal brothers have very short uh, lives, and his theory is that to a large extent it's due that humans have a mutation such that they can't uh, eliminate uric acid, and so uric acid stays at high levels, and that's the reason that humans can have such a long lifetime without getting uh, cancer and without uh, aging as quickly as uh, other creatures on Earth. So uh, uric acid is the most potent antioxidant in serum and it's present at very high concentrations. It's the second most potent antioxidant in the liver and the the human uh, species lost the enzyme that, that breaks down uric acid, so that increases uric acid in the body, preventing cancer and aging and allowing humans to live uh, longer and also the apes. The apes are also uh, very uh, long-lived creatures. And what's interesting is that this increase in uric acid occurred about the same time that humans and apes lost the ability to make uh, vitamin C. So humans and apes are somewhat unique in that they are some of the few animals on Earth that can't make vitamin C. And the reason that humans may have been able to tolerate this loss of vitamin C is because at the same time they started making uh, excessive amounts of uh, uric acid, which ended up being an even better uh, antioxidant than vitamin C. Some of the references, scientific references. So uh, purines, which, which are the compounds that make uric acid, some of these are some of the cofactors and you see uh, one of these is folinic acid, a form of folic acid. So if you want to increase of the amount of uric acid you could take this particular nutritional supplement, folinic acid. Um, and you can also take molybdenum. However, this is a case report of molybdenum toxicity. So I want to warn everybody, just because a thing is good in moderation doesn't mean it's going to be good if you take a overwhelming amount. So too much molybdenum can be toxic, so you have to be very careful in the amount of molybdenum that you take if you decide you want to increase your uric acid. So these are some of the nutritional methods to increase uric acid, supplement with folinic acid to increase purines, um, increase the diet of high purine foods, anchovies, sardines, organ meats like uh, liver and kidney, asparagus, beans, peas, and caviar. Um, 
use serum uric acid as a guide for supplementation. Uh, uric acid is extremely cheap test. I would think in a lot of labs it might be like $10 or something uh, like that. And so uh, you could do it on a frequent basis. So you, you, if you have MS, you might want to uh, increase your uric acid up to about the normal value. But you don't want to exceed that because if you exceed that, you're more likely to, um, you're more likely to have problems with uh, excess uric acid, which could cause gout. Uh, but if you bring it up just to this level, or perhaps just a tad lower than that, uh, that could be a target uh, that could be very worthwhile that would help to uh, reduce the uh, MS symptoms. You can also supplement molybdenum, and the recommendation for an adult is don't take any more than 100 micrograms per day. New Beginnings has molybdenum. It's one of the sources of molybdenum as a supplement if you want to uh, take supplementation. And of course, you can find out if you're deficient with the hair metal test can tell you whether you're uh, deficient in molybdenum. Uh, if you want to, if you have too much uric acid, you would do the opposite thing. So if you had gout, you'd want to lower your uh, foods that are high in purines that are converted to uric acid. You'd su supplement with methylfolate, which does not stimulate purine synthesis. And uh, you would want to make sure that your vitamin supplements don't have molybdenum. You would want to avoid alcohol because alcohol makes those crystals of uric acid form in your big toe. Also, cherry intake is good. And also avoid the high fructose uh, corn syrup, which also contributes to the uh, uh, uric acid. So uh, now I want to get to the uh, to the hair the hair metals. Uh, get back to them. So 55% had cobalt high, 45% had uh, calcium or copper high, 36 zirconium high, 27 percent had a variety of high metals, uh, and the uh, so these are metals in which one third or more of the metals were abnormal, and uh, some of the important ones were, uh, as I mentioned, lithium and molybdenum. And toxic metals are also very important. As we talked about earlier, the individuals who had mercury amalgams had uh, higher incidence of symptoms, and the symptoms dissipated after removing their mercury uh, fillings. So in this group with MS, 4 of 11 had toxic chemicals above the 95th percentile. Uh, 7 of 11 had high tin which was the most abnormal result. And again, I think this is something that's brand new in MS uh, research and uh, could be very important. Um, four of 11, 36% had high nickel. Uh, that's very interesting. And there were some high, uh, three of 11 had high aluminum or mercury and uh, two of 11 had high lead or antimony. So a very high percent percentage of uh, individuals with MS had abnormal heavy metals. So again, I think this is highly significant to the point it should be, everyone with MS should be testing for toxic elements and in my estimation could, should consider uh, safe chelation techniques to bring the metals back to a the normal level. So one of the, as I mentioned, tin is was one of the compounds that were most elevated, and organotins are among the most toxic and widely distributed uh, environmental chemicals. They're used to uh, kill uh, mollusk and barnacles. 
uh, and so they're used on boats and fishnets. This particular group that was tested was from the uh, Vancouver uh, area, which would be a high seafood uh, area. And so what I suspect is that, that, uh, that perhaps these individuals had a higher than usual exposure to uh, organotin and that perhaps even though seafood is healthy in this particular area, it could be that tin toxicity is a uh, a bad factor, and I I think that the, that it would be well to consider uh, chelation with very safe uh, in, uh, chelating agents, DMPS and DMSA. Any any physician can uh, administer things. They're very um, very safe way, and they can remove not only the organic tin but other uh, chemicals as well. So these organic chemi chemicals are toxic to the liver, so hepatotoxic, neurotoxic to the brain, and also toxic uh, to the uh, immune system. One of the organic chem chemicals was been found to be toxic to the myelin, the exact the exact substance that is uh, altered and and is uh, abnormal in multiple sclerosis. Uh, and for the uh, the final um, the final go round, we're going to be talking about a very toxic chemical called phospholipase. Uh, this called phospholipase A2. Phospholipase A2 is what is found in the venom. Of, uh, of most poisonous uh, snakes, and the reason that th this this uh, enzyme is so toxic is because it has the ability to break down the cell membranes, the the coating of the cell that holds the all the contents of the cell together, and the cell membrane is made of phospholipids called lecithins, and these lecithins are broken down by phospholipase A2 to form arachidonic acid, which is a strong detergent, as well as lysolecithin, which is a strong detergent. And these substances do not function uh, in, in the cell anymore, and these substances can cause severe uh, inflammation and pain. So, the, that's why the snake venom sometimes causes extreme uh, pain because it produces large amounts of this lysolecithin, which is the molecule uh, that causes pain. Uh, and luckily, there's a readily available nutritional supplement called uh, cytidine diphosphate choline, or sometimes called CDP choline, which is a potent inhibitor of PLA2. In other words, turns off the, all the negative effects of the phospholipase. And the reason why the phospholipase is very important because it is one of the major initiating factors of inflammation, producing the lysolecithin here, the arachidonic acid, which produces a lot of other molecules um, that uh, cause uh, harmful reactions in the body. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because we tested this phospholipase A2 in multiple sclerosis patients. Fascinating uh, findings. Those who had mild or, or uh, symptoms in remission had very low levels of phospholipase, those with moderate symptoms had increased levels, and those with the most severe uh, symptoms of MS had the highest amount. So this is a very significant finding. It was already reported in a previous study, and, and of course this doesn't mean that everybody with multiple sclerosis was bitten by a snake, but the phospholipase a2 can form in the human body as well under certain conditions. So I think the conditions that lead to multiple sclerosis, a lot of those may be initiated by 
the phospholipase A2. So the phospholipase A2 causes the breakdown of the, of the tissues uh, in the neurons in the brain and, and so results in a loss of myelin and uh, the destruction of the uh, brain tissue so it doesn't function as well. And I suspect that the use of supplements to reduce phospholipase A2 might result in diminished, uh, in, uh, diminished symptoms. So a summary, um, candida appears to be a common factor in MS and antifungal treatment and testing should be explored. So in the Great Plains study, 100%. In the previous study of seven patients with MS using DNA techniques, 100% of individuals had uh, fungus problems. Elevated hair tin is common and other heavy metals are also common. And, and I believe, and anyone who has high values, they should consider chelation treatment. Molybdenum deficiency and uric acid deficiency is common in MS and using careful supplementation uh, there can be uh, treatment of multiple sclerosis. Uh, virtually all the MS patients had deficiency of omega-3 fatty acids and so supplementing with omega-3 fatty acids could be very helpful. The phospholipase A2 is directly related to MS severity and is easily treated with nutritional uh, CDP choline. So it's a common nutritional uh, supplement available from New Beginnings and uh, it has uh, extremely few side effects and is a proven uh, inhibitor of the phospholipase A2. So some of the most important tests for, for multiple sclerosis, the hair metals test for both the toxic heavy metals and uh, low amounts of essential elements such as molybdenum and lithium. Uh, uric acid, finding out if you're one of the people with uh, lower than average uric acid, that could be a major factor. IgG food allergy test to determine sensitivity uh, to things like uh, milk and wheat as well as candida antibodies. Uh, organic acid test checks for uh, candida markers, vitamin deficiencies, toxic exposures, mitochondrial damage and genetic disease. Phospholipase A2 is done in urine and fatty acids uh, is very important to determine the omega-3 fatty acids. Um, if you want it to be even more comprehensive, this is the list of things you would look for and of course the uh, adding on the vitamin D is an extremely uh, important aspect. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it 